night on Focal Point. This place was a ghost town. Now people are coming in towards Belfast. They're attracted by stuff. It's dissipating our sectarian divides. I actually um, signed up uh, in like a sort of competition and I got uh, I don't know, drafted to come here. So that's why I'm here, because I'm uh, a part of the race. Babies who are breastfed do get the best possible start in life and, and that's, that's fact. We know that from the scientific evidence that they're less likely to have chest infections and ear infections um, and that they're uh, less likely to be admitted to hospital. When people talk about my rights to do this or my rights to do that, there is a dialogue that you have to have about which rights are qualified, which rights involve balancing and proportionality, which rights are absolute. There are absolute rights in human rights terms. I was away for a long time and I came back to Belfast and Belfast is now a jewel in the crown. We see uh, across the road to the wonderful Titanic quarter and we see uh, lots of ships coming in from all over the world. You've got 50 ships, denominations of people from all over the world. We've got everybody here and this is the place to be in the UK apart from Wimbledon. It's good. Well, I just saw it advertised in the news and on the radio and on the internet obviously so I thought it was interesting to come and see it so I did. And what all have you seen today? Have you been to the phone fair or just the ships? Or? Well, so far we've seen uh, live music down the road and been on a couple of the ships and stuff, so it's really, really good day. I'll be in the market later on, so it'll all be good. We have about 55 tall ships that are coming into Belfast to take part uh, in a race going northwards to Norway and Denmark. And there will be a plethora of other ships and boats that will join, of course, over the next few days. So this is a spectacle that Belfast has seen before, back in 2009 and back in 1991. But it's bigger and better than ever. We have 50% more Class A's. They're the really big, big uh, um, tall ships. And we have probably about 40% overall more ships this time than in 2009. The site's a lot bigger. It's about a square mile. You right to Pollock Dock, from Pollock Dock right back to Titanic Quarter. Uh, and the Titanic building and we have a lot more entertainment for families uh, uh, and for visitors alike. And can you tell me what brings you to Belfast? Uh, I actually um, signed up uh, in like a sort of competition and I got uh, I don't know, drafted to come here and then I'm just gonna you know participate in the race so that's why I'm here because I'm uh, a part of the race that is the Torset Races. We are 10 people in the crew and I think six are trainees which basically means that six people don't know a whole lot about sailing uh, and the rest are, I don't know, a part, of, a part of the real crew. They sail with it all year long and stuff so they really know a, a lot about it and are, and are going to teach us as much as they can about sailing. I'm from Lisbon, from the capital of Portugal and well we came to, to Belfast for the tall ship races. This is the, the, the first port and we're going to go from here to, to Alessund for the first race this year. Well, I'm not a, a typical sailor, well, sailing sailor. I prefer this ship because I can be in every harbor for three, four days and get to know new cities. I'm still young, I'm only 25 years old, so for me it's the best to get to know Europe. Well, we've been around, around the, the village here and um, had something to eat and I found a long time getting parked because we're both disabled and have the blue badge. And I had booked a mobility scooter for today with them and we couldn't get down near the Odyssey at, at all. Disabled access needs to be improved. I mean, this definitely should be a really big designated area and people allowed through. Because um, that's what, well, if you can't walk, you can't get around the place and it's a wasted journey. When you get in, it's really good and enjoyable. My uncle was the captain of a merchant navy ship for years and uh, he decided to uh, maybe encourage me to get away from the sectarianism of Belfast in the 70s and 80s and I went around the world. I went to uh, the west coast of Africa, southern Africa, I went across the, uh, my goodness, wonderful, went across uh, the Atlantic uh, to northern and southern and central America. Like this wonderful ship you see here, I went to Brazil, Brazil, uh, quite a few times. I love Recife, I love Rio de Janeiro and I had a wonderful time and I would encourage anybody to sail the seven seas. With over a million visitors expected and no dedicated lifeboat presently in Belfast, the RNLI felt it would be sensible to put a boat in for a few days just to provide extra safety for all our visitors. 
Well, our whole message is, is about respect the water. The water is there to be enjoyed. It's a fantastic facility on our doorstep, but it's also dangerous as well. The r and are here to rescue if you need rescued. Ideally, provide preventative advice to stop you getting the difficulty in the first place. Um, but actually, if you are in need to be rescued, we have volunteer crew who are very highly trained, wearing the best possible kit to rescue anybody. I think when you look in the water, there's nearly as many rescue boats today as we have um, tow ships. Um, that won't be the case throughout the entire event, but with a volunteer crew, we'll be here 24 hours a day until the end of the event. Well, I think coming at the time of the, uh, the, the quite kind of polar 12th in, in, in terms of lots of tourists are coming in now, which is good for the first time, because they never, they never came in. This place was a ghost town. Now people are coming in towards Belfast. They're attracted by stuff. It's dissipating our sectarian divides. And this nautical event is so important because everybody loves the sea. Everybody loves a sailing boat. Everybody appreciates these lovely tall ships. So it's a good, congruous effort by all of us to come together and show Belfast in its good light. say to anybody who was interested about coming down to the tall ships but hasn't been before? Definitely do, it's a really great day, the council's put it on really well and, and you know it's free so it's all a good day, come on down. We're joined in the studio today with Janet Calvert and Lisa McAteer, a new mother, to talk about breastfeeding and the scheme to help ease mothers' minds while breastfeeding in public. Janet, the Public Health Agency have a scheme for businesses aimed towards women who breastfeed. Can you tell us about it? Yes, so the Public Health Agency have a scheme. It's called the Breastfeeding Welcome Here Scheme. And we have over 400 businesses, council facilities and other attractions who have joined the scheme. And what that means is that uh, they have committed to welcoming mums who are out and about with their baby who wish to breastfeed in all public areas. So um, we're delighted that fairly recently Parliament buildings have also joined the scheme and Belfast City Council as well have joined the scheme. So again that means that we're creating welcoming environments for breastfeeding mums and their babies. And can you tell us what other businesses have joined the scheme? Well there would be businesses um, like coffee shops um, and some hairdressers, a few hairdressers, that kind of thing. And then the like of the City Hall would welcome breastfeeding families. It mainly would be places like um, where you can, you can sit down, have a cup of coffee, that kind of thing. Um, but it just means that whenever mums are worried about feeding their babies when they're out, what am I going to do? What if I come across somebody who is disapproving? They know that that, that facility, that premises will stand up for the mum, will say, well, you know, we welcome breastfeeding mums. Would you like us to find you another seat rather than ask a mum to stop breastfeeding? Babies who are breastfed do get the best possible start in life and, and that's, that's fact. We know that from the scientific evidence that they're less likely to have chest infections and ear infections um, and that they're uh, less likely to be admitted to hospital um, with gastroenteritis, which is a severe stomach infection that babies get. We know that things like asthma and eczema are less severe among breastfed babies. And of course, we know that mums who choose to breastfeed, and the longer that they breastfeed, they reduce their risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer and osteoporosis. So there's rigorous evidence about why we need to be encouraging more mummies to breastfeed. Sometimes there's a stigma with breastfeeding in public. Do you hope schemes like this will help improve women's confidence when they go out with their babies or toddlers? I do, I very much do. And I think that um, certainly incidences where a mum might be challenged is, is, is fairly rare, thankfully. But I think it is important because babies need fed. Breastfed babies tend to feed um, when they need to. And sometimes if it's like the like of today, it's a hot day, they'll want to feed quite often. Um, and so they need, mums need that freedom so that they can uh, incorporate breastfeeding into their everyday life and uh, feel relaxed and confident. Because after all, they're doing a very important thing for their health and their baby's health. And so they need, they need to be supported to do that. And they say, 
You recently had your second baby. Well, my first baby boy, I had him um, when I had just finished my GCSE, so I was quite young. <laughs> um, for me, just the thought of breastfeeding, I think it was more fear for me and fear of the unknown um, and the fact that I had to go back to school quite quickly after. Um, I thought formula feeding was just the right choice for me at the time. Um, but now that I'm a bit older, um, the thought for me was, if I can do it, I'll do it. So I'll give it a go. And originally I had thought I was going to do it for six weeks and here we are, four months down the line, I'm still cool. going. And Janet, for mothers to be or new mothers, breastfeeding can be very overwhelming and not a lot of people know where to get the support. What services are available in Northern Ireland? Sure. Well, within the health service, um, we have an initiative called the Baby Friendly Initiative and most of our maternity services are signed up to that. And it means that the midwives and the other staff have received training and so they, they know about breastfeeding, they know how best to support a mum to breastfeed. And that helps so that early getting off to a good start with breastfeeding can make a real difference so that 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 all helps but then when mums go home it is great if family and friends are supportive i mean that's key if your partner is supportive and and grannies are supportive that can make a real difference but there is also further support out there within support groups so there are breastfeeding groups and i think lisa goes to one in belfast here in smile sure start and um, where mums can come along have a cup of tea have a chat with other mums and then if they have worries about breastfeeding they can talk to a midwife or health visitor who maybe would be there and be able to help them there's also other support from the like of um, voluntary organisations. So La Leche League would be a key breastfeeding voluntary organisation and they have trained breastfeeding counsellors who will take a phone call, who will chat to a mum at a support group and in that way just give that wee bit of encouragement and extra information that can help mums to continue. And Lisa, you go to a few uh, support groups. Can you tell us about those? As mentioned, I go to the Smile Sure Start, which is a specific group for breastfeeding mums. Um, and that ranges from mums maybe who've just had babies a few days ago, right up to new breastfeeding toddlers. Um, so that's a great way to, like, if you have any problems, any issues. Um, as Janet said, there's a um, health visitor there, there's a, a midwife there. And it's just a good support to have because although you have the the phone call, you can ring up helplines. I think it's just better maybe to meet someone peer to peer. You can speak to them, speak to a health professional and without having to worry about maybe what anybody's going to think that you, you've got someone who's probably got hands on experience. And how important is it to have the support from other mothers? Um, for me, it was very, very important. Um, I'm not sure if I would have went as long, maybe without the support groups now, I'm not sure, I might have, but for me, I found them a great, it's a great support network and it just encourages you to get through different times where it might be difficult, like certain growth, when they're having growth spurts or when maybe they're just feeling a wee bit unwell, you can speak to other mothers and they maybe give you some tips or just things like that. So it's good that way, I really enjoy going to the groups. Compared to the rest of the UK, Northern Ireland has considerably low rates of breastfeeding. Why do you think this is? We've seen an increase in the last 20 years in the number of women starting, to, starting off breastfeeding. But where we're really struggling is with women carrying on breastfeeding. So we might have two thirds, about two thirds, 64% of mums will offer a first feed at the time that the baby is born. But then by the time the baby is six weeks old, there's only 33% of our mums still breastfeeding compared to 55% in the rest of the UK. And similarly, the start off rates um, here are much lower, would be 81% as opposed to our 64%. And even if we were to take that wider, wider and compare ourselves with Scandinavia, in countries like Norway and Sweden, 100% of women start breastfeeding their babies at birth. And then at six months, 80% would still be breastfed. And at a year old, 30% would still be breastfeeding. Now the recommended um, length of time for breastfeeding would be uh, the World Health Organization talks about if you can exclusive breastfeeding till around six months and then continued breastfeeding into the second year of life and beyond. Mums might choose to bottle feed rather than breastfeed. They might decide that bottle feeding seems more convenient for them, that breastfeeding might take up a lot of their time so it's only them that can do it. They might also have concerns about breastfeeding maybe being painful or difficult. And then of course there is the other issue of embarrassment while feeding out and about. You know some women would feel, uh, and especially young mums, I don't think I could feed in the presence of others, I would be too embarrassed. So they tend to be the reasons why here in Northern Ireland women decide not to breastfeed. 
We've seen a rise in stories of mothers breastfeeding older children up to the age of six. What are your thoughts on this? Well, my thoughts would be um, it's up to individual mums and children how long they want to feed. It would be very unusual to be still be feeding at that age. It's a very small percentage of, of women. Often whenever you start solids, babies will feed a lot less. They'll only want to feed, you know, maybe um, a few times in the day and during the night. Um, and and that's, that seems to be the natural progression where babies almost make the decision themselves. It's lovely if mums can reach their feeding goals and decide, well, you know, I, this is what I wanted to do. What's really, really good is if you can surprise yourself and decide to feed longer than you even intended. And um, I think Lisa would say that, that Lisa had only intended to go to six weeks and is still breastfeeding Adam and he's doing beautifully at four months. And that's what you want. You want, um, I suppose, all breastfeeding to be valued because there are mums out there who struggle and they maybe only feed for a very short period of time. But that's all good. All, any breastfeeding is good and we need to encourage women to be able to, 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 to feed for as long as they wish. There are some mothers out there who simply can't breastfeed and receive negative feedback for it. How important is it for new mothers to know that if they can't breastfeed that it is okay that they can't do that? I think it is really important that every mum is supported no matter what decision they make about how they feed their baby. And I think that um, whenever mums start off breastfeeding and then find themselves um, not able to continue I think they need support and they need um, told about how they can continue to have a close a really close connection with their baby you know so that, that there's th certain things they can do like um, when they're bottle feeding hold their baby lovely and close you know that that kind of information can really help and um, the initiative I talked about earlier the baby friendly initiative is for all babies so um, midwives and health visitors and sure start staff are working towards a set of standards that we're helping all parents to develop a close and loving relationship with their baby and so bottle feeding mums get that support too and that's that's really important I suppose it goes back to any breastfeeding is always better than none at all and it's lovely if even mums can breastfeed for a short time so that when they have their next baby, a bit like Lisa, they may choose to breastfeed and breastfeed for longer. If anyone wants to find out more information about the services that you've talked about today, where would they find them? The Public Health Agency has a website, it's www.breastfedbabies.org and on that website is a list of support groups throughout all of Northern Ireland um, and also information about the Breastfeeding Welcome Here scheme so it tells you exactly where the premises and facilities are that are members of the scheme. And then in terms of practical help with breastfeeding and getting, getting to it, it really helps if women can read up a wee bit talk to friends who breastfed, learn it as much as they can before they have their babies so that they're well prepared. So we produce a publication that's called Off to a Good Start and in it it has some nice images and some information about how you help your baby to feed, how to get it right so that you can avoid those challenges, things such as feeling sore, worrying about not having enough milk so that mum's confidence is increased. So it is important if we can to be well informed and that information is, is readily available through the health service and through our own uh, website breastfedbabies.org. Janet and Lisa, thank you very much for coming in to talk to us today. Thank you. The Commission has a round of community engagements across Northern Ireland, so this meeting in the Conway Mill, uh, we're going to the Shankill Women's Centre, we'll be at Suffolk and Lenardoon Interface Group, and then meeting the Police Service of Northern Ireland and Area Commander and Community Support Team. And it's very much about telling others about what we do, but much more importantly for us, listening to what are the issues on a day-to-day -day basis in the community, what are the issues for police as they uh, police this part of, uh, of the city and it's really mu very much gathering of information to feed into the work we do and make sure that all the work we do is grounded in being important to local communities. You have the sort of run-of-the-mill issues that, that you sort of have come across, the sort of drugs and alcohol, you know, um, young people with low self-esteem and confidence, educational issues, so young people becoming neat. But the, the, the main issue for, for me is young people not actually having a say on, on things that affect them. You know, young people in the Upper Springfield area especially, 
don't understand political structures and, and, and don't really engage in, in politics, which is a major issue because by the time they come till 18 and they are allowed to vote, then they don't really know what to do. They're going, I will vote for X because my parent does or my grandparents do. So that's, that's a major issue for us. My issue was around legacy and quiz, um, and I wanted a big bit of clarification um, what the hum about human rights issues were around them cases. 1971, and over a three-day period in Ballymurphy, 11 people were killed. My father was one of the ones that was killed. There was no police investigation into any of the killings at the time, and the families themselves got together and started to do their own research. And through doing our investigation, we realised that the inquest, the original inquest, were flawed. We started gathering up as much information as what we, we could. And in 2010, we handed what we had found out over to the Attorney General. And after he looked into it, he decided that a new inquest should happen. There is an argument in that a lot of people have um, used the term human rights when they're not talking about human rights at all. And they're talking about, for example, their right to parade, rather than saying that that is uh, a, a right where proportionality has to be taken into account. It's a limited right. I would prefer the term, anyhow, civil rights, because civil right is between the individual and the state, and proportionality doesn't come into it. It is whether there's a right or not. And I think that people are not aware of the difference between civil rights and human rights. And perhaps more emphasis should go on the term civil right, like the marriage debate at the moment. Instead of saying human rights is a love is a human right, I think people should say civil marriage, civil right, because it's not up to anybody to intervene in that. That is a civil right the state has to sort out what the rules of marriage are, and that is between individuals and the states. When you call it a human right, then all sorts of people come in and talk about proportionality in churches and all sorts of things, whereas sometimes the term civil rights should be used rather than human rights, although human rights are what give you the right to bring your civil right to Europe. So you do need human rights, but civil rights are more important. I think people are much better aware of rights issues, and that's a really good thing, and they understand that human rights is part of that. Sometimes the dialogue is not one that I recognise in terms of international human rights standards, so when people talk about my rights to do this or my rights to do that, um, there is a dialogue that you have to have about which rights are qualified, which rights involve balancing and proportionality, which rights are absolute. There are absolute rights in human rights terms. You cannot torture or treat someone inhumanely or in a degrading fashion under any circumstances. There are other rights that are, uh, have to take into account competing positions, so the right to freedom of assembly and around parades, the issue is much more than complex. So um, those discussions are really useful for us in terms of having that two-way engagement. There was a lot of issues, not just my issue, but very informative. Um, there was a couple of things that I'd heard today that, I mean, I'm aware of the Irish language bill that they're trying to pass. Um, I wasn't aware of the pitch that they're trying to build in the Falls Park. Um, and coming from Ballamurphy, I think I would have known. So it was a lot of issues um, that was discussed and stuff that the commissioners learned today, which was interesting. And hopefully the commissioners will take, take away the stuff that they heard today and try and make changes and get it passed because if they have a voice, well, if we let them hear our voice, then they can pass it on to somebody higher than Edmonds. And now, tomorrow's weather.